morning. It's always a pleasure to be back here. If you'd like to turn in your Bibles to the Gospel of John, chapter 13. The Gospel of John, chapter 13, where we will be spending our morning and feasting on God's Word. I believe it was Jeremiah that wrote, Thy words were found, and I did eat them, and they became to me the joy and the desire of my heart. So we pray that uh, uh, His Word will be that to us, that feast, that... Um, but let's go ahead, and what I'd like to do is just read through our passage this morning. We're going to try, at least uh, to our best efforts, cover verses 1 through 17, and so I'd like to go ahead and read that for you. John chapter 13, verses 1 through 17. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments and, taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with a towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, The one who has bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean, and you are clean, but not every one of you. For he knew who was to betray him. That was why he said, Not all of you are clean. When he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, Do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do, just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things... Blessed are you if you do them. Let's pray, shall we? Lord Jesus, we thank you for your precious word. We thank you for the word that we have heard this morning. And Lord, we pray that you would be with us, that you would work in our hearts as we go on to seek to understand what you have said. Lord, may we be encouraged. May we be challenged. May we be moved, Lord, to a a greater level of, of love in service, and worship to you. Lord, if there is someone here who does not know you as their Savior, who has not been washed in the blood of the Lamb, Lord, may you open up their heart to their sin, see their need for a Savior, Lord, and see what you have done for them. And may today be the day where they experience new life. May you be glorified this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. How do you prepare a group of men who are completely self-consumed, self-focused, and they're in a society that is completely ruled by the rules of men, not focused on Christ, consumed with uh, their own understanding and their own interpretations of what is to come? How do you prepare them? to start the church? How do you prepare them to be of the mindset, to be of the heart that would be sufficient to be the tools to start the bride of Christ, the church? That is answered this morning as we look in John chapter 13. This is a pivotal text because up till now, John chapters 1 through 12 have covered the first three years of Christ's life. 
Now they're in the upper room. They go into the upper room to celebrate the Passover. This is going to be the last Passover that is celebrated. For the next morning, Christ is going to be crucified. This very night, he will be betrayed. And the next morning, he will be crucified. And so under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, John takes no less than five chapters to cover what he is talking to his disciples about in the upper room. John chapters 13 through 17 all focus on within a few hour period in the upper room. Think about that. That is 20% of the gospel of John is focused on like a three to four hour period of time. Chapters 1 through 12, three years. Chapters 5 or 13 through 17, three or four hours. And then the rest of John covers the remainder of the time. And so you take that five chapter section and it's such a critical section where Jesus about to depart out of the world. What is he going to say to his disciples? What is he going to do with them? How is he going to get them to the place where he needs them to be. Now, we all know it is the Lord that builds his church, right? And we know the story in the book of Acts and how God superintends and God works. But God needs to arrest their heart and to bring them to that place. And so what is he going to say? What will you say to someone on your last, last day of life? What are you going to impart to them? What are you going to do? What are you going to show them? And that's what John chapters 13 through 17 are all about. So how do you start that? What do you do to kick all of that off? And that's what we have here in this passage in John chapter 13. And so we want to look this morning at the high call of humble service. The high call of humble service. We find an incredible, incredible example and foreshadowing of the cross here in John 13. And so we want to break it down, though, and look at a few particulars. As Jesus sets the example and as he washes the disciples' feet and as he has different interactions with them, we want to understand that and see what is the big picture? What is he communicating? So first we want to notice in the first three verses, which you could say is somewhat of an introduction to Jesus washing the disciples' feet, is the Christ who enables humble service. The passage is all about humble service, serving with humility on multiple levels that we are going to, as we are going to see. Well, we're going to look first at the first three verses, the Christ who enables humble service. Some have said that without these three verses, this whole story of the foot washing is nothing more than just a good moralistic story. Here's a good moral servant type thing to do. But yet it is something far more than that. It is something far more than just getting the dirt off the feet so that you don't have to smell your buddy's feet as you're eating dinner. It's something far greater. And so notice with me in the first three verses. He says, Now, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of the world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper... When the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God, he rose up. In these first three verses, there is so much. A sermon could be done just for these three verses alone. But two things suffice this morning to notice. As, as we are challenged at the end of the text, I'll give the ending away, we are challenged to follow Christ's example and to humbly serve. How do we do that? There are many people in this world who do incredible acts of service, many unbelievers, many non-Christians, right, who serve one another. Well, there is a unique uh, thing that is needed if we are going to serve in a humble way, and that is that Christ must enable us. And we see in this passage, we want to notice two things. First, that we are enabled to serve through Christ's sovereign, redemptive plan. And I get that from twice in the first three verses. We notice this Christ mentioning that he, is, he left, came from the Father, and he's going back to the world. He's departing out of the world, it says in verse 1, and going to the Father. In verse 3, it says that knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God. 
And so twice within three verses, there is this mention, there is this focus of leaving the world, coming from God, being in the world for a limited particular period of time for a specific purpose, and then going back to the Father. Notice here he's not focused on, hey, tomorrow I'm going to die, I'm going to be crucified. He is going directly, he's talking about, I'm going back to the Father. There is that emphasis on, on a specified, purposeful time here. And he mentions in verse 1, he says, Jesus knew that his hour had come. If you were to back up and look in John chapter 2 with the, the wedding in Cana of Galilee, and he tells, he tells Mary, he says, you know, my time has not yet come. Jesus was particularly aware and knew exactly what was to occur and what should occur at every point in time. He had a sovereign, redemptive plan that was being carried through. It was sovereign in the fact that he was in control of time. He was in control of circumstances. He was in control of what people did. To the degree that he said, now is the time for Judas to betray me. And in fact, you could think of it this way. And this just blows my mind. Think about it. And here in verse, verses 1 through 3, he mentions Judas. Judas is mentioned repeatedly throughout this text and the verses that follow. What could be the most evil possible thing you could ever do is physically in front of his face, betray the living God. Sell the living God out to death for money. To his face. Yes, he tried to do it in a sneaky way. Christ knew. But think about it. That was actually part of what God was using to bring about your and I redemption. Say it this way. Jesus was using the most evil act of man to bring about the most gracious act of God. He says later to Judas, you know what you do, do quickly. In other words, hey, I have a timetable and let's go. He has a redemptive plan and redemption is what brings us to a place where we, like Christ, can serve with humility. But not only that, he mentions in this passage a special love that he has for his own. Look with me again in verse 1. He says, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of the world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world. He loved them to the end. There are two things in particular. He loved his own. He had a special love for his own. There is no doubt you do injustice to the Bible if you, if you try to say that Christ has the same love for unbelievers as for believers. He does not. The Bible is very clear on multiple levels and multiple ways that those who are his own, those who are his children, he has a special love for them. Yes, he has given a bona fide offer of the gospel to all men. Wh whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Yet there are those who are his own. He says that he loved his own who were in the world. His own are those who are believers, particularly, in, particularly the disciples. But all those who look forward to the cross for redemption. How are we equipped to, to humbly serve? It is empowered through the love of Christ that has already been poured out within our hearts, exemplified to us, and then given us the ability through the Holy Spirit to love others. And as we know, it is a particular love. It is love that is the theme of these five chapters. In John chapters 1 through 12, you have the word love being occurring 12 times. In chapters uh, 18 through the rest of the book, you have it occurring 11 times. In chapters 15, 13 through 17, you have the word love occurring 34 times. This discourse, this upper room time where Christ is interacting and, and, and with his disciples, encouraging him, challenging them, has this massive underlying theme of love he calls later to say a new commandment i give to you that you love one another just as i have loved you you also are to love one another what is he saying in the text as i have loved you as i have loved you and empowered you and given you then the ability 
to love others, that is what my expectation is to do. And that is what is to be at the heart of our humble service. As we humbly serve, as Christ served, it is through love. It is through a special love. He loved us in a special way, his own. And it says he loved them to the end. That Greek word is the idea of, of bringing it to a fullness. He loved us to the full or to completion. It is a perfect, full, enduring kind of love that carries out to the end. It is not the kind of love that abandons or stops, but the kind of love that goes to completion. And Christ loved you, if you are a believer, with a special love and a complete love. And it's through that then that we are enabled to be like Christ and serve. But not only that, we go on to see uh, in the, both in the context and stated in the passage, some contrasts that elevate the humble service that we are called to have. Some contrasts that elevate the humble service. I won't take the time, our time is short, but if you were to go back to Luke chapter 22, which is Luke's uh, covering of the upper room, you would, you would learn that as the disciples are coming into the upper room, guess what they're arguing about? Guess what's on their mind? Guess what's preoccupying their heart. It is, am I going to have the best place in heaven? Right? They're arguing about who is going to have the best place in heaven. Why? The disciples had this view that Jesus was coming. He's our redeemer. He is the one who's going to kick Rome out. He's going to set up his kingdom right here and right now. And man, we want to have the good spots right beside him. They were preoccupied with themselves, with their position and their status. In fact, they were even squabbling with one another. They were contentious. You know, it's easy to serve someone, even sacrificially so, who has done a lot for you, who is nice, who is pleasant, right? We've all done that. We've all been served by that. It is wonderful. You know, you serve each other, and it's just a great thing. What about those people who are just continuously rubbing you the wrong way? How is your, your passion and desire to serve them? Does it go up? Does it go down? You'd have to admit in our flesh it goes down, doesn't it? Why, you say that about me? See if I bake you another roast, right? Or, right? Our desire to serve one another oftentimes the level is at whatever level they have given us a reason to serve them or motivation to serve them. And here Jesus is about to wash a bunch of stinky feet of a bunch of guys who really are not even thinking about him going and dying on the cross. They weren't fully getting that. But they're preoccupied. Hey, what's my place? Am I going to get the good spot? So the contrast of, of, of the disciples and their, their contentious squabbling over who was going to be first in the kingdom. But not only that, even more powerfully so, the contrast of the conspiring disciple. As we read in Judas, it says, oh, where does it say of Judas here? In verse 2, during supper, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, the Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus knew full well exactly what Judas was doing. And this is not just an off-the-cuff, oh yeah, oh, I'm just going to do that, right? For Judas, this was a long, protracted, purposeful, planned out betrayal to conspire to, to turn in the Son of God. And he knew full well what would happen when that happened. And yet, we have every reason to believe that Judas was one of those whom Jesus washed his feet. Would you have washed Judas's feet? Would I? Oh, well, maybe you would have just made sure the water was like scalding hot, right? Or something <laughs> like that. Judas was the enemy. Yet what does it say in Romans chapter 5, verse 10? That even while we were enemies, what did Christ do? Christ humbly serves even his enemies. And even later in the passage speaks of, uh, you know, who is the one who's going to betray you? It is whom I'm going to give this bread. Well, the host, someone who have elevated status such as Jesus, 
such as a rabbi or teacher, when they gave someone food, that was like an honor. That was like honoring them. That was like uh, bestowing blessing and honor upon them. And that's what he did with Judas. Even to the point where Judas is actively then going out and betraying Christ, Christ is honoring him. Christ is washing his feet. Christ is setting an example, a contrast that elevates love, that elevates a humble service beyond, you give me a reason to serve you, then I'll serve you. It elevates it to where even though you are trying to fight against me and see my destruction at every level, in every way, you're backstabbing me, you're talking about me, yet I am going to sacrificially and humbly serve you in a messy way that costs me everything. The world does not know that kind of love that does not know that kind of service. At the heart, we have to admit, the heart of most of even our service of one another is some level of a self-centeredness. This is a whole nother level. So the contrast, the elevate humble service, the Christ who enables humble service, but going on to see in a powerful way the condescension of Christ that exemplifies humble service. Look with me in verse 4. So Jesus, knowing that he had come from God, verse 3, and was going back to God, verse 4, rose from supper. Now, as I read this verse, how many of you are familiar with Philippians 2? Right? Verses 1 through 5 talk about have this attitude, which was also in Christ, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not make it robbery to be equal with God. That passage. Think about the verbs here. Verse 4, he rose from supper. Jesus is at the place of prominence and position as the teacher, as the rabbi, as the host, and he rises up from that position. He rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments and taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. Now, you know probably as well as I do that in those days, right, as they all wore uh, some type of sandal and the streets were not these nice, clean streets that we have everywhere, right? There were these dusty roads, and so your feet got pretty dirty pretty quick. Even if you were at your house and you just had a bath, right, and you're going over to your friend's house for supper, well, what they would have there is they would have a humble servant. They would have a, 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 it was usually thought of one of the lowest things, one of the lowest levels that is, you would take the lowest status of a person and they would be the one who would wash people's feet. And so you would make sure people's feet were washed as they came into your house. Why? Because their feet were dirty and it was just common courtesy. It was a way to serve people and, and it was very practical. In those days when they sat down for dinner, it wasn't like us where their feet are just tucked, tucked, tucked nice under a table. They're reclining around the table. So very likely the disciples, as they're all around the table, their feet are in each other's faces. Now, you know as well as I do, feet, as they are dirty, do not smell that great. They do not give you a greater appetite for the roast. On the contrary, well, nobody had washed the disciples' feet. There was no one there but disciples and Jesus. Certainly the disciples didn't want to do that. Presumably, they, neither one of them wanted to give up the opportunity of vying for the spot of the greatest in the kingdom by washing everyone else's feet. So first notice, verse 4, the rapid number of verbs that are used to describe what Jesus is doing. He rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments, taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet. Seven verbs in rapid succession. The Word of God is always very purposeful. And so what is he communicating here? It's almost like time is slowing down. And now Christ is in slow motion and it's like, and this, and this, and this. And he's describing in minute detail what Jesus is doing. Yet all of it being very powerful. He rose from his place of prominence, rose from his place of position and honor as the host. Now just think about the disciples and what's going on with them most likely. As Jesus rises up, Okay, what's he doing? He takes his outer garment off, right? That is the outer garment. That was what really identified you for who you were. And underneath was more or less, I mean, it wasn't quite your underwear. It was like a robe, but, you know, it was, it was your average. It was a T-shirt. 
kind of an idea. So now he's in his undergarments. He's laid aside really his position and his honor and his prestige and his, and his power. And what does he do? And he says, and he taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Why the towel? The towel is what he is going to use to help wash the messy feet. Washing dirty feet is dirty business. It's lowly business. It's humble business. We know that because John, when they're asking John, uh, you know, are you the one? And what does John do to describe how lowly he pictures himself to be compared to Christ? He says, I am not even unworthy to what? Untie his sandal. He's talking about the process of foot washing. So John, in his effort to convey the magnitude of difference between him and Christ, says, I'm not even worthy to wash his feet as one of those despicable slaves. And here the Son of God gets up, lays aside his outer garments, takes a towel, wraps it around his waist, pours water into the basin, and he began to wash it. Literally, in the verb is he began. It is a process that he goes around the table and is washing and wiping them clean. Some say in regards to this, always make sure your servant's towel is much bigger than your ego. But imagine the disciples. They knew they didn't wash each other's feet. They knew it was something that should have been done. And now the one of honor, the one who, you're kidding, he's doing this? We know that as we look at Peter's reaction. Uh, you know, the, the, the amount of sudden like, okay, I'm uncomfortable. This is weird. This should not be happening. He should not be washing our feet. But the Son of God, about to go to the cross, starts washing the feet of a bunch of contentious, self-centered disciples. And one of them, a murderous disciple. Washing their feet. Unbelievable. This is supposed to be the one who's about to take down Rome and set us up nice and pretty with the kingdom. He's washing my feet. The condescension of Christ here, this is much more powerful than Jesus showing some humility to wash some feet. We see early on in the passage, we're going to see it with his interaction with Peter. Jesus here is foreshadowing a greater service. A greater, more powerful, more humble, more sacrificial service of going to the cross. Despicable, dirty service to cleanse. Let's see that in his interaction with Peter as we see the cleansing reality behind this. See, ultimately Christ is not here to just make life better. To, to improve quality of life. Here he has a particular motive and purpose. He's not just here to make dinner more pleasant. He's here to teach a bunch of self-centered disciples. Get your minds off of yourselves because I'm going to need you to build the church. And you're going to need to expend everything you have for people who hate God and who are going to fight against God, yet the gospel is going to conquer that. But it needs to come through those who have completely laid aside their own prerogatives, their own prejudices, their own desires, and who are willing to get messy and serve and love to a degree greater than you could ever possibly drum up in your self-will. And it will only be able to come through someone who's fully submitted to and dependent upon Christ. Well, let's look at his interaction with Peter as our time near his end. Verse 6, he came to Simon Peter. <laughs> we always know it's going to be good when Jesus starts interacting with Peter. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet, right? So Peter's basically saying what all of them are thinking. You, the emphasis is on the pronouns. You are washing my feet? But Jesus answered him, what I am doing, you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. After what? Well, it's after the cross. After he dies and raises again and ascends and the Holy Spirit comes. It is only till after then that the disciples are going to fully understand what's going on. 
and, and headed into overdrive. But he tells Peter, you know, what I'm doing now, you don't understand. In other words, what I am doing now has far greater significance than just getting the dirt off your feet because none of you are willing to do it. It is much more powerful of a message I'm trying to convey to you than just you need to make sure people stay clean. But you will understand. How patient is he with us? He spent three years with these guys. And they still don't get it. So he says, so Peter, though, in, in, in Peter forum, said to him, you shall never wash my feet. There's Peter trying to tell the God of the universe what he should and shouldn't do. It's not unlike us many times. You shall never wash my feet, he said. And then Jesus says these words. It almost gives you goosebumps. If I do not wash you, notice he doesn't say his feet. If I do not wash you, you have no share with me. If I do not wash you, you have no share with me. We'll comment on what that means in a moment. Peter then said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. He just said, you're never going to wash my feet. Now suddenly, hey, give me the whole spa treatment. Peter here is showing a devotion to Christ, really, when Jesus says, hey, if I don't wash you, you have no share with me. You don't have any part, any connection with me. Peter wanted, if nothing else, he wanted more desperately than anything else to have a relationship with Christ, to be with Christ, right? He says in another place, you know, where we want to go. He wanted to be with Christ. And so when Christ says, hey, I got to do this or you have no share with me, then Peter, all right, man, let's go for the whole treatment. Wash everything. But Peter's still not getting it. He's still in the material. They're here and now. Jesus says in verse, verse 10, Jesus said to him, the one who has bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean and you are clean, but not every one of you. You see how he's going way beyond the foot washing to talking about something far greater, far more significant, and that is salvation. That is the gospel. So let me sum up, because we need to, to, to address the, the closing of the passage. What is, what is Jesus saying here? What is he conveying? Number one, that this episode of foot washing is foreshadowing the gospel. It is foreshadowing the cross. The service that he is calling them to is far greater, far more significant, far more expansive than just washing feet. It is serving through the preaching of the gospel. Secondly, without the cleansing from Christ, there is no relationship with Christ. He would go on to say in chapter 14, verse 6, right? I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes unto the Father except through me. It is only through the cleansing blood of Christ that one can have any hope of any connection, any relationship, any forgiveness with the Lord Jesus Christ. All of our service means nothing if it is not oriented to and, and pointed at the gospel. The third, when you are washed with Christ, you are clean. And he tells Peter, you are clean. But not all of you referring to Judas. Judas was not saved. You are clean. When you have been cleansed from Christ, you are clean. There is no loss of salvation. There is a permanent cleansing. But then he goes on to say, but you only need your feet washed. What is he referring to? Really, the, the spiritual implication is exactly what 1 John 1.9 says. If we, believers, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to cleanse us from our sins. There is a continual relational cleansing that is going on as the believer is continually confessing sins that don't, don't threaten to sever the relationship but the fellowship. So there is with believers a continual cleansing that is going on and that is indicated by the washing of the feet. So we see the condescension of Christ. That is, I encourage you sometime to read that verse of Jesus washing the feet, and then go to Philippians 2. He laid aside his, his prerogative to be God. He did not fight to think of robbery that he had to, to, to hold on to his place of glory, but he left that, humbled himself, taking the form of a servant, 
be found appearance as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death. It's all in Philippians 2. And here Jesus is modeling that through this foot washing. But let's look at closing the call to humble service. Verse 12, when he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place. Notice the text specifies that. He's going back to his place of prominence of his of, of being the teacher and the master. And he said to them, do you understand what I have done to you? <laughs> the answer would be no. You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. So he affirms his place. He is Lord. He is master. He is teacher. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. Now, now he is not calling us here to a, a third ordinance of foot washing. He is calling the disciples to, you need to take what I have done, and that's what you need to model. That is the example that you need to set going forward. Being willing to get dirty and messy. And when it's the gospel's perspective, being willing to sacrificially, exhaustively serve even your enemies. Even those who aren't pleasant, who aren't nice to you. But to serve them. Why is that? He goes on to say, Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. In other words, if that's what I have modeled, being your teacher and your Lord, then that's what you should be doing as well. So let me just give you three things, aside from already the challenges and the encouragements that we have seen through the text. Three closing things that we see here the consummate blessings of serving, humbly serving. And that is number one, is joyful. He says in verse 17, if you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Blessed are you. Happy, joyful. An inner disposition of joy and, 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 and happiness comes from the one who has denied themselves, laid aside their own prerogatives, their own plans, their own preferences, and humbly serve, even in a messy way of so. You promote Christ when you do that. You know, we as Christians like to use the vernacular. We want to be Christ-like. We want to be cross-centered. Do we really? you want to be Christ-like, start washing some feet of some people who are messy. Start washing some feet. And I don't mean that in a literal way. That's where you'll find true joy. That's where you'll find the promotion of Christ. That's where you will have the greatest opportunity for others to see Christ in you. And third, humbly serving preaches the gospel. Humbly serving preaches the gospel. I remember back in California, I lived in California, we would uh, a couple weeks out of the year go to the uh, Navajo Indian Reservation in Arizona. And uh, we, we had learned enough about the culture to understand that when we went in there, our desire was to share the gospel, but we pretty much had resigned to the fact that the first three years we would be there, we would not have any opportunities to preach the gospel verbally. For the Navajo, we're, we're, a lot of people are like this, but they're very particularly a type of people that they really don't listen to what you say. They watch what you do. And so we knew we would have to go in there and show them who we are as Christians before we ever had the right or the opportunity to tell them what it means to be a Christian. And that was a powerful, wonderful thing. And so we went in there and we served people where you're sitting there and you'd want to say, why are we doing this with this person? They don't care about it. You know, they're not appreciating it. We served them. But 
Three years later, we have some powerful opportunities to preach the gospel verbally. People don't care what you know until they know that you care. How about you? Are you ready to go wash some feet? Are you ready to preach the gospel in the most profound, powerful way? Let's pray. Dear Lord, we uh, are unworthy and unable to these things. We know that, Lord, our flesh at any moment, and it seems like at every moment, wants to jump in and, and, and stop our sacrificial service, saying, what are you doing? You're wasting your time. Lord, we in our flesh don't want to take the time. We got our agenda. We got the things we need to accomplish. Lord, we're too prideful. It really bothers us when people don't really appreciate our service. So forget it. We're not going to serve them anymore. And Lord, it is great to be appreciated, but Lord, we know that we need to get past the flesh. We need to crucify the flesh with its passions and desires. And Lord, thank you that you are so patient with us, so forgiving. Lord, you lavish your grace upon us. And Lord, may you, through your Holy Spirit, enable us through your grace to not just go and do some acts of humble service, but to have a heart disposition of humble service that as a default responds the way you would want us to respond. Lord, we know that you can do that in and through us. Lord, give us the desire and the willingness to get messy, to be humble, to wash feet, because we care most about the kingdom to come. As the appointed man wants to die, and then comes judgment, you say in Hebrews. And there are many who need to hear the gospel, who need to see it. So, Lord, do that through us, your church, your bride. In Jesus' name, amen.